Hey everybody, welcome back to HBC Tech Shorts, the engineering water cooler here in AWS. A um, couple of weeks ago, we uh, we hosted the AWS HBC Speeds and Feeds event online. A lot of people were pretty interested in the breakout sessions afterwards. They really wanted to dig in to uh, to a new product or a new service that we've launched just last year, late last year, called FSX for OpenZFS. So. Uh, we've got the product manager for that here today. I'm happy that I'm joined by Delwyn Olivan, from, uh, who's, who's joining us from New York. Uh, hey, Delwyn. Hey, Brendan. Thanks for having yes. me. Um, ZFS has been hugely popular in the, in the HPC space for people wanting to build things like home directories. Right? We use Luster for extreme performance, and then we use OpenZFS for you know, really scalable home directories so that people can park their data somewhere. Um, and that that desire to have all of the cool features of, of ZFS comes with people when they come to the cloud. So there's a lot of people been asking for this for some time. Uh, you're you're the popular guy because you're you're the guy turning up with this very cool thing. Absolutely, no, we're excited to be here. <laughs> it's been a, <laughs> a, a few <laughs> months in the making, definitely, and and now that the product's out there, yeah, we're really excited to hear how, how customers are starting to starting to use right. it. I, I mean, the way we see this, right? It, it, as you mentioned, it is a fully managed solution, drop in replacement for customers who are looking for shared storage over NFS, and it gives you the power of ZFS without all the complexity, command line, hard work of potentially managing it. And I apologize if I offend some people by calling ZFS complex, but I, I, I could take that liberty. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of start off by maybe just showing how, how quick and easy it is to, to spin up a file system. So we're here in the AWS console uh, with a few clicks of a button. I just select the file system type that I'm trying to create um, and then hit next. And we actually have a quick create option here where we set a bunch of defaults for you uh, according to what we expect most customers need. All you need to do is put in the storage capacity and say I'm asking for a 64 gig file system. I hit next and it summarizes what I'm going to get and I can click create and I'll have one in just a few minutes. So well, you can see that you've just replaced, right uh, you've replaced like an RFP. That's Not to mention provisioning the, the drives, setting up the Z pool, setting how you want to stripe that, like all of that is under the hood here and you can spin up a file system in, in just a few clicks. And in fact, if you wanted to go through the same process and customize your file system a little bit further, we offer the standard create uh, just in parallel right beside it, where right. you can customize say the, the the IOPS that you want for, I think the first and foremost thing, this is a performance oriented file system. It doesn't scale out to the levels that Luster would have in, ter in terms of like the hundreds of gigabytes per second, but we do scale up to 12 and a half gigs per second. So well, one of the things we put top at this uh, console experience is the number of IOPS that you're looking for. You can provision up to 160,000 on an individual file system, as wow. well as the throughput capacity that you're looking for. You are, uh, you can provision from 64 megabytes per second to four gigs per second. And the four gig per second um, deployment can actually scale up to 12 and a half from cache. But we can dig into, it sounds like I'm selling you a little bit of snake oil here, but we can dig into a little bit of the why there. <laughs> yeah, let's get into that a little bit later. That's, that's cool. <laughs> um, wow. So that, that and that is that is like really fast. Then what else is there in here? Oh, you get to choose the data compression. Uh, algorithms and a few things like that. Yep. So on the file system itself, we support two forms of data compression, Z standard, which really compresses data really small, and LZ4, which uh, compresses data with uh, a little less compute capacity to deliver higher write throughput. So we're, we're giving customers the option to fit that to their specific workload needs and patterns. And, and so like, and like with, uh, you're, you're running these things on Graviton2 instances as the file headers, right? Yeah, so we're, we're built on the um, AWS Graviton family of processors, um, I think. And I guess the cool thing there with the compression, because the Graviton 2s are so, so they're beefy little, little processors, they can handle compression on the fly. And if you've got highly compressible data, not only are you like potentially doubling the capacity, but you're also potentially doubling your throughput, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So That is um, one of the 
biggest kind of uh, uh, counterintuitive things about compression. Uh, in, in fact, we work pretty hard to explain this to our customers, and, and I think we, we still uh, struggle with it a little bit. That in in terms of compression, you both benefit from having the data sit smaller on the disks, as well as when you now transmit that data, it's a smaller chunk so that you are able to transmit more on an effective basis through the same pipes that you would have had before by having each of those individual kind of data chunks be smaller than it had to be uh, uncompressed. Yeah. It's okay. It makes sense. It's just that we've all been, we've all had it beaten into us over the years that if somebody's telling you you can have compression and it not only increases your capacity, but also doubles your throughput, we all think the vendor must be lying, but it <laughs> turns out it's true. Um, exactly. This is one of those, you know, this is, well, it really CPUs just got a lot faster in the last few years and a lot cheaper to be able to deploy for things like this. Anyway, that's cool. And uh, another thing here is it's an NFS accessible file system. So we enable customers to set up that NFS export however they want, uh, whether it's read, write, kind of uh, specific IP addresses, so providing access controls of that nature. Um, lower down here, I, this is a, another very performance oriented, but pretty obscure feature. It's called the record size. It, it basically it informs the size of the individual blocks that are used to store your data. And while the default you know, caters to the vast, vast majority of workloads, as a performance-oriented uh, offering, we wanted to make sure we gave customers the option to, to configure this or customize this to the types of patterns they expect. Yeah. And we see a lot of this in like databases where there's a specific page size and your database application is going to keep writing and reading at that 8K page size or whatever the page size is for your for your specific app. Mm -hmm. And if you align this to that eight kilobytes, then you're really minimizing any overhead that you might see on individual operations. So you can really maximize your performance. And you can set up uh, automatic backups. So we offer uh, backups of your entire file system that are durably stored in S3. You can set up a schedule and decide how, how many of these you want to keep. And uh, those are all fully managed for you. So you don't have to deal with any snapshots or any uh, scripting or anything like that. Um, and you, you get the benefit of the 11 nines uh, on S3, as well as the ability to copy those across regions if you're trying to do some more complex disaster recovery types of uh, strategies. You could even use that in a kind of a functional way. If you had a data set that you've been building on an FSX for OpenZFS in say, you know, um, US East one, you could do a snapshot uh, and have that, you could, push that snapshot over to another another AZ or more to the point, potentially another region, and then bring the file system up there. Absolutely. Another interesting use case that we're seeing actually is in like the dev test space. So uh, if we have a few customers that every day they have their production file system, they take a backup of it, and then they restore it to a new file system that they dedicate for their testing environment. So it'll every day synchronously kind of get updated with the latest production data but also be completely isolated from their production environment so they're not impacting their production users. And you can spin that uh, up in, in a matter of minutes, uh, just given how quickly we're able to, uh, to spin up a file system and also take these backups. Wow, that's actually pretty cool. Uh, so you're actually doing a, you're doing dev test, but, but test with real data. Yep, exactly. um, yeah, fantastic. All right, so once we've got our file system up and running, and maybe we go back to one of the, to that one that you cooked earlier. But yeah, if I go into this file system, we can pretty easily figure out how to attach it. So like now that it's created, you got to get it onto a, onto a client so you can start working with the data. Mm -hmm. And when you click this attach window, it'll provide you the, the mount string right here that you just need to run on an EC2 instance. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Look, mile no hands. And you'll have to pseudo the mount as well. Oh, uh, there you go. And there it is, CD. And there's our file system. There it is. And there's our file system. Uh, one of the cool capabilities of ZFS are the ability to take these point in time snapshots, clone that data um, in a matter of seconds, and really run uh, experiments. So in an FSX file system, you are you can organize it into individual volumes, and this is the unit of a, of a snapshot or a clone. So it just gives you an, an additional layer of granularity underneath the file system to, with which to configure your settings and kind of work with your data. And what I did was I created this baseline volume that we can start to run experiments on. I actually 
um, seeded it with a little bit of data just to show you the power of how quickly this can happen. Um, so if you take go into this baseline folder, let's do a ls lh. You can see I have a um, have 20 gigabytes in these random files here. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something that you, you could have from a data set that you're you have in production or that you're you're just running some new experiments on. Let's there you go. There it is. Uh, let's let's add a few more lines to it just to make sure everything's working. There you go. So we have a, a file that says Hibooth ABC. So I can create a volume. I will call this the clone. And I'll only turn off compression just, just to keep things consistent. And I'm going to point it to the baseline volume that we were just working with as the source. And I'll just I'll say create a clone of that volume. Hit confirm. What it's going to do is basically create a brand new volume that points to the same data in, as the baseline volume that we were working with. So we're able to create one just with pointer math and ZFS black magic. We don't so have we've to essentially just forked, we've forked the file system. Exactly. Um, right. And now this is, I just clicked into it. It's already available. All I need to do is just pick attach. up the mount string again. So it's now completely separate. Looks like a completely separate file system. I need to make the directory and then let me mount it to clone. All right, so now we have a completely uh, separate, isolated file system. <laughs> Has all the same data, 20, let me just do Coming from LS, the same place. 20 gigs, uh, let me count. Now you're gonna delete file. that file. Yep. Let me, yeah, let me delete that file. <laughs> All right. And okay. It's not there anymore. We can go back to the baseline one. Still exists in that baseline. So we've run a completely parallel experiment and we spun it up in seconds. And now we can do whatever we want with this clone volume. We can run another test on it. We can copy it to, to keep it for, for long term. But you can see just the power of this. In a few clicks in the console, you're able to basically work with the same terabytes of data <laughs> created in seconds right. and run a completely parallel experiment. This is insanely cool. All right. Um, I love it. I want one. Um, where do I buy it? So FSX for OpenZFS is available in seven of the biggest, seven of the biggest regions. Um, so if anybody wants to actually get more information on it, they can pretty easily go to this page. And this is actually the, the landing page for the product. And you can get all of the details like, you know, pricing and availability and regional locations and so forth. But uh, Delwyn, thank you for coming along today. It was actually super cool. I learned a whole lot. Uh, and, and in fact, so it's been a few years since I've spun up a, an open ZFS file system, but, but the ease with which you did that, uh, there's there's something to strive for. That was pretty pretty neat. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Boo. Uh, for everybody else who's watching at home, uh, if you've got other topics that you want to see us bring along in the future, if you want to get Delwyn back to do a deep dive into a particular area that you thought was interesting that we didn't cover enough, reach out to us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. Uh, but until then, uh, and until next time, thanks to everybody. Thanks, Delwyn. Talk to you all soon.